Hi everyone, and welcome back to The Shack, and part two of our Sinclair Spectrum Next series. In this episode, we'll be doing the first round of hardware upgrades, taking the memory from 1MB to 2MB, which should be more than enough for anything we want to do. There are some considerations with this much memory on a Z80, so we'll cover that later. We'll also add this ESP32 Wi-Fi module to allow our Spectrum to talk to the outside world, and to reduce the need to remove the SD card for data transfer and upgrades. And lastly today, we'll add in this Raspberry Pi Zero coprocessor. The full potential of this hasn't really been explored, but there are some immediate benefits. We'll need to solder some headers to the pipe before fitting, so we'll do that too. In a later episode, we'll dive back in and fit the real-time clock and an extra SD card slot. All of this will enhance our experience with the Next and importantly set us up for an elegant development workflow. So grab a cup of tea and a couple of biscuits and let's get on with it. In order to do these upgrades, we do of course have to open the Spectrum Next up, and this prompts the question, does this invalidate the warranty? Well, let's take out the six screws holding the case together while we're thinking about that. And simply, it doesn't, because there isn't one. In fact, the Spectrum Next is technically a hobbyist machine, and there's an expectation that you're going to tinker in some way or another. So just understand that if you're going to do this, it's at your own risk. That being said, nothing we're doing here is particularly difficult, I'm just going to take my time and be super careful. Two of the screws on the bottom are hidden under the extending feet, so just pop the feet into their open position and you can easily remove those screws. And with all the screws removed and the spectrum face down, you can easily lift the bottom of the case off and set it aside till we're done. The Spectrum Next main board is held in with four screws, one in almost each corner, and the daughter board is also held in with four screws. We're going to need to remove all of these. It's worth taking your time with these screws, as unlike the case screws, which screw into brass barrel inserts, these screw directly into the plastic case, and therefore over tightening and being generally heavy handed can damage the threads. When all of these screws are out, the main board will feel ready to remove, but don't just go pulling it straight out as we first have to remove the keyboard connectors and true to their original heritage, they're a flimsy plastic membrane. There are three of these membrane connectors in total and removing them requires a gentle, consistent pull. And with the last connector removed, we're free to carefully lift out the main board and set the keyboard aside for now. So here's our next, lying on the table waiting for its operation. This is where our additional memory modules will go, our Wi-Fi module will plug in here, and our Raspberry Pi will plug in to these header pins just here. Let's look into these components in a little more detail. The memory chips we're using are 1x512K AS7C34096 pin compatible units. These are about £15 off eBay for two and they're a simple push fit. The Wi-Fi module is an ESP8266-01S and these were three for £7 on Amazon and again they're a simple push fit. The Raspberry Pi Zero was under a fiver from Pi Moroni. All links are in the description. And considering the specifications, that's simply incredible. I had headers lying around, which I can cut to size, and they'll go on the bottom like this. So let's first push in the Wi-Fi module like this, being careful that all the pins are lined up correctly. A firm push is all that's needed. For the memory chips, it's important to note the orientation of the sockets. Pin one is marked with a cut corner, and this matches with a small indentation in one corner of the chip. The chips are also smaller than the sockets, so it's important that the chips are placed as you can see here. A fair amount of pressure is needed to seat these chips, so don't be too scared if it feels like you're pressing too hard. If everything is lined up correctly, they'll just pop in. It's really worth double checking here to make sure the chips are in securely, they're level, they're oriented correctly, and they're at the right side of the sockets. 
let's move on to the Pi and first we have to install the headers. You can buy Raspberry Pis with headers pre-installed if you don't have a soldering iron or simply don't want to do this bit yourself. Any of you who are familiar with my Harlequin 128K build will know I'm no stranger to a soldering iron so I'll cut my headers to the right size and pop them on. As mentioned previously, it's important that these headers go on the bottom of the board, not the top. This is a common mistake and can take a long time to rectify. A spot of flux to help the solder flow properly and we'll quickly get these headers on. I use a bit of tape to hold things steady while the first few solder joints go in. And just a few minutes of brandishing a hot iron and we're done. Fitting the Raspberry Pi is again a simple matter of making sure all the pins are lined up with the headers correctly and then a bit of a push to seat the Pi firmly down. Some people fit small standoffs to the Pi to help it stay secure and level. I'm not doing that and I'll explain why shortly. So here's our upgrades for this episode. We fitted our Wi-Fi module, our Raspberry Pi and our memory. In a future episode, we'll fit the real-time clock, which goes here, and we'll solder on the additional micro SD card slot to the underside of the board. But for now, let's put it back together. Before we do, there's a small blanking plate that we need to remove in order that the ports on the Raspberry Pi can be used. This was by far the most infuriating part of this whole task. While I'm struggling in the background, let's talk about how the Spectrum Next manages to use two megabytes of memory when the Z80 itself can only address 64K with its 16-bit address bus. The memory is divided into banks, which the machine can page in and out as required. Once a section of memory is paged in, it can be used. The Z80 can still only address 64K at a time, but with clever bank switching, much larger programs can be held in memory. That blanking plate is finally out, so we'll cover memory managing in more detail in the next episode. Time to put the unit back together. Please remember to download and burn the Pi Zero disk image and insert the SD card into the Raspberry Pi before putting the case back together. I didn't and had to undo it all again. Very annoying. Again, be very careful with the membrane. It's quite fragile. Once the keyboard membranes are reattached, we can put all the mainboard and door to board screws back in being careful not to over tighten and damage the plastic of course. Looking at the back of the case we can see why I opted not to put the pillar supports on the Raspberry Pi. These sockets sit on the plastic lip of the case and any pressure on these ports will be in and out not up and down. It's your choice of course if you do this or not on your own next. Finally we'll put the bottom of the case back on and put the case screws back in. Once this is done, we'll power up and test that each upgraded part is recognised by the next. We'll hopefully get connected to Wi-Fi, make sure the Pi is contactable, and of course, make sure we can see all that lovely memory. Well, the first bit of good news is that on the main menu we can now see 1792K of free memory so we know the memory upgrade at least was successful. So let's now check that the Raspberry Pi is installed, booted and working OK. To connect to the Raspberry Pi over the serial connection, we're going to use the Terminex program in Demos URT Terminex. Once this runs, a terminal window opens up and we're connected to the Pi. From here, we can control the Raspberry Pi as a machine in its own right. We can list directories, create folders, delete folders, and run programs directly on the Pi itself. Well, that all seems to be working too. So let's finally test that the Wi-Fi works, and for this, we need to use another utility that's supplied with the Spectrum Next. 
this time we're going to navigate to demos slash ESP and run the Wi-Fi 2.bas program. Once this program is loaded, we're going to take option 5 to scan networks and hopefully my local Stingray network will appear. And it does, although curiously it appears twice. Let's connect to the second one. I put in my password, which clearly I'm obscuring here. And we can see that the Spectrum Next goes through the process of connecting, assigns as an IP address, and there we are, we're connected. I call that a successful test. So, thanks for joining me this episode. All the hardware installation seems to have gone well. In the next episode, we'll set up a development environment in order that we can start to actually use and develop for this wonderful machine. If you enjoy these videos, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Please leave your comments below and I look forward to seeing you next time in the shack. Bye for now.